Again, the experience has been very varied. As Vivek said, where we stand today to where we were 24 months ago, there has been progress, there has been steady progress, but it's uh, uh, not uniform. There are discom uh, there are regulators that have you know uh, completely uh, moved uh, very very uh, progressively, and uh, like I said, it's been a very mixed bag. And sometimes the reasons are uh, not necessarily uh, you know policy driven. When I mean, when I mean to say, if if you look at like we're doing a very large project in Punjab, and we're looking at uh, Vivek, you were saying net metering is not a, a constraint. In our experience, net metering is now a massive constraint. Because when we started doing projects, the ticket size was 100, 200, 500 kilowatts. 500 kilowatts was a large project. Today, we have multiple megawatt projects, like one, two, three, four, five, a rooftop project which could be 10, kilo, uh, 10 megawatts. I know there are very few roofs, but a lot of the large automotive companies, for example, large cement. Uh, some of this could be on site, some of them are also, uh, you know, open access, 50 megawatts of open access. So there are large ticket sizes working today, where net metering definitely becomes a constraint. And I'll tell you why we find it becomes a constraint. Some states simply don't allow third party owned net metering. Now that is something which I don't understand. Is your issue destabilizing the grid? Is your issue, no, no, some five people will corner the 30% or the 40% of the of the uh, substation capacity and we want to be fair and give a chance to every rooftop owner or is your issue who is putting the money in you know so that i find very strange where you decide that captive ownership that i find very very strange then even if you're saying everybody should get a chance so many people are not interested so many people are biding time so many people are saying oh you know you're saying we took two years to decide two years back you were offering me seven rupees today you're offering me five rupees if i wait two more years it'll be three rupees if i wait two more years you'll be paying me money to install solar so there are those and then there are those who are saying no i i want a five megawatt plant saying no sir you're you know you're sitting in a state where you're paying six and a half rupees if you have a shutdown every sunday and we do the entire minimum load and that tracking and that matching, we still find that there's an 8% power shortfall. You can add that into the tariff. But sometimes it doesn't work out. I mean, in states like Maharashtra, it might. In some states, it may not work out. So, you know, kind of those who are not interested will develop an interest and then want a rooftop project is stopping those who are already interested and willing and eager from going to larger capacities. Then you have states like Punjab where it's a very progressive net metering policy. I think the limit is some 8 or 10 megawatts or something like that. And then you research a little bit and then the country's largest rooftop plant, which is on that, uh, you know, Radha one of those, Swami. yeah, the Radha Swami one. So obviously they don't have a requirement, a very powerful entity. So there's a very, very great net metering policy in place, which works for me. but. You know, they have not really uh, devised the policy for any, you know, research driven purposes. It's simply because, oh, this entity exists and they want to feed it in. Kerala, that Cochin power, uh, that uh, airport, I don't know if the rest of the country, you know, if everybody gave me that liberal uh, solar policy to work with, just so I could have a, you know, I am energy neutral or forget, I am, uh, you know, actually uh, energy carbon positive. It would be a different story. So these are special cases and instances uh, that come on. And a couple of special projects, no problem with that. You know, that's an airport. It's a state's brand, a country's brand. Feel free to do that. But it's so random and so haphazard that one doesn't really know. Even within a state, different, you know, you have multiple uh, utilities, multiple discoms, and one behaves differently from the other. It is very inefficient in how you, in, you know, it takes months sometimes to deal with them. The plant is commissioned and we are backing down the inverters because until you get net metering. And so we had this issue with one of our clients at some mall. So whatever they were in, and this is before net metering. So whenever they were shut down or on some days, the excess was going into the grid. So it was registering in our meter. So we were billing them for it. And it was also registering in the discoms meter. So they were also billing them for injecting power into the grid. So the poor guy was getting hit from both sides. So he called up, he was in a rage. He said, come and switch off your plant now. So then you put in some relays, which stops that happening. So I find that while there's progress, it's I really do not see a direction, a path, any consensus. 
and that is going to hinder your uh, story i don't perceive uh, on the rooftop scale at least any intent in driving the prices down i don't in, in my experience the discoms have, or the uh, regulatory authorities or the energy authorities they really have not at all even asked us what is your ppa pricing because it does not really touch them in fact uh, i think in states like maharashtra they'd be very happy if the solar tariffs were higher because then the incentives for people to move across would be less yes there are things which are happening which will impact see for us when we do a comparison because solar and we are all doing on grid solar we're not talking of solar with storage so solar is like you know it comes and goes right it, typically it's a bell curve of production so and when solar is not present these are grid synced plants or dg synced plants the the required energy is being taken from other sources so the grid is actually acting as your storage so we are not at asking clients to reduce their installed capacity or their contract demand or any of those factors so the fixed costs remain the same what goes down is the variable costs and now we have found states what they have done is so supposing states were paying like 7 and a half suppose the commercial uh, the industrial or commercial tariff was 7 and a half or 8 rupees of that the base tariff was about say 5 or and then there were taxes and duties and other things depending on one may that took it to 6 and a half 7 7 and a half or 8 and fixed charges were separate so now what they have done is they have said okay we'll reduce that variable charge down from a 6 or something to a 4 and we really going to jack up the price or the costs on the fixed side which you're not going to get rid of so then when you do a variable cost of tariff per unit with taxes and all included and then you compare it with the solar that advantage is gone so that i find is a very sneaky underhand way of kind of you know protecting your own interests and not allowing solar and i just want to end by saying that today it's become an us versus them from a developer and a discom point of view it's not an us versus them in any other forum it's not us versus them when it comes to regulators electricity authorities the government mnre seki ireda any of those agencies but i have not yet had a forum where i've sat along with the discom and talked about this but it's really become an us versus them scenario what i would like to say is we need the fact that discoms are in poor health is of great concern to me because the entire solar policy and especially distributed solar it needs to stand on the shoulders of a very very strong and competent discom so that's where you know i know which is why maybe from a selfish interest as well i want their interests and you know their you know backs to be kind of protected and taken care of because without the discom this sector will not exist i think very just, very very valid point sorry just to add uh, a few points to that um there are a lot of challenges because uh, most of them are uh, uh, like i think uh, someone from the panel already pointed out that uh, they do not understand it fully well uh, did not uh, realize the uh, realize that the fact that rooftop solar is coming is actually going to help their network manage their network better and uh, in fact if they can find a way to work with us whoever we are doing rooftop solar uh, there is so much more benefit that they can derive out of this uh, uh, the other point that i wanted to make is uh, none of the discoms across the country have made any effort to really understand the impact rooftop solar has on grid stability everybody has got theories around it but we have seen lot of states and countries announcing in fact tamil nadu themselves on a on a if you see if you go and talk to their sld on a really um, uh, in the middle of uh, uh, probably around october september when when they have the wind at the peak or even earlier in fact uh, you 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 listen to them that they 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 they'll tell you that 40 to 50% of their power is coming from wind and they agree to that and nobody uh, nobody has done a scientific study which says that 5% is the right amount or 10% is the right amount or 20% is the right amount Uh, all the uh, constraints on the uh, with regard to sanction load that you cannot set up uh, you know 1 megawatt more than about 1 uh, megawatt for net metering benefits is uh, just like that arbitrary uh, transformer capacities you cannot overload them by 30% 40% or 50% whatever the states have come arbitrary 
I have I have sat in a few discussions, policy making discussions, and those numbers have not been scientifically derived at. I can vouch for them. And when something like this is happening, there is so much potential benefit that is going away for waste. I have seen uh, educational institutes who has who has significant amount of roof and their ability uh, to generate is significantly larger. They are not able to because of the net metering benefit, which is only applicable for one megawatt, mega, one megawatt or lower projects. Uh, similarly, I, I, the virtual net metering as a, as a concept has not at all been discussed. There are probably one or two states. Uh, I don't know. If, correct me if I'm wrong. Probably Delhi and uh, uh, some of the other states have done it, but. As a concept, it is something, I mean, immensely beneficial to the consumers. And if, if discoms can really use all these factors, and you know, if, if all of us, in fact, stakeholders, like Ritu pointed out, we want the discoms to be, uh, you know, really strong, and we cannot wish them away. They are stakeholders in this, and uh, we require them to understand what we are trying to do, work with us. And if regulators also can come along on board on this, have meaningful discussions around this, and the rooftop penetration will pick up significantly, significantly larger than what it is today. Uh, I would take, I would like to take a position saying, say I don't belong to this sector, and I am taking a view like a policy guy. The the challenge and what I've seen in the last seven years, starting from when then large solar farms and now to distributed solar, the the, f the fact of life is, for a country like India, uh, the way discoms are going to behave is going to be extremely critical for the sector. And time and again, we have seen that. The first flavor was, do a FIT with discom in wind. Many players are here who have done multi-100 megawatt wind farms. And gradually, you started seeing that discom after discom started paying after 6 months, 12 months, and went to 18 months. Your IRRs go for a toss. Then the new flavor was, let me do an APPC plus REC, Renewable Energy Certificate. So that was a huge flavor at that time. And REC prices for solar, I mean, just three years back was almost nine rupees. And again, some couple of billion dollars were poured in. And the reason REC market completely tanked was the biggest person who was supposed to buy it was Discom, and he does not have the money to buy RECs. Then on what basis are you going to go and tell large cement companies or steel companies to buy RECs? So that market is tanked. Now we are talking about uh, solar. The, yes, I mean, everybody, I think, agrees with the fact that discoms being in such bad financial health is an issue for the whole sector. And I think that is something we all have to be extremely cognizant on, uh, cognizant about, because that is going to hit, that is going to hit our business. The reason being, so just to explain, it's a, it's a, I think it's a socioeconomic thing. Uh, even now, if you see in the GST regime, one thing which is not under GST is power sale. It's still with the states because the amount of uh, cloud that electricity yields on, say, the so-called vote bank is immense. So state after state, the ratios might be different, would give subsidized power to farmers or free powers to farmers. You have issues in Delhi where you go to JNJ cluster and the discom people get beaten up, you know, for asking them to pay the bills. I mean, that's actually the case. And then you have subsidized power to the lower income groups and the industrial commercial segments and higher income groups are typically cross subsidizing it. And the fact is we are going after those high-end customers who might be consuming only say 10%, 20% of the volume, but are contributing almost 40, 45% of the profits. So the fact of life is that from a, so it's, it's not something that we sitting here can solve it, but I'm pretty sure that government is cognizant about it. Unless there's a clear policy direction and a roadmap or a strategy, the way say reform is happening on the finance side, it's happening like, so GST, etc. Something similar has to happen on the discom side. I mean, they try to there. I don't think it has worked out. It has, it has worked out because unless the discoms don't become well capitalized and they are part of this journey, which is which is not easy. Right now, the fact is it's quite anti. Our business and their business is quite anti. And leave India. We have seen that I think in in Europe as well. Right now, all the solutions on rooftop that's coming there, they are saying. I'll not depend on discom. That's why storage and battery management system is, you know, proliferating so, so, so widely out there. Because beyond a certain point, even the most advanced countries like Germany, the grid is saying, "Thank you, I don't want, I can't take net metering, I can't handle your power. You please take care of it. If you want to go off grid, I mean, I mean, great, but I can't support you because I just don't have the wherewithal." And I think that's what we all have to be uh, very cognizant with, with our business models. Because the fact is, time and again. 
if that factor is not taken into picture you know it it leads to a lot of stress yeah i think some of the points that uh, you know the, the panel has been raising all directly have an implication on financing also uh, so you know whether it is the fact that each state uh, has its own set of regulations and there is no uniformity or the general intent of discoms uh, you know to instead instead of supporting uh, distributed generation seeing this as a compete so all of this has an impact on financing also uh, maybe shishant you you can share your views on what are the typical issues uh, that you are wary of in your financing such businesses you mean the issues uh, that we are wary of when we finance rooftop yes okay so uh, one was um, the the tenability of the contractual agreements is what we touched upon second um, that comes to my mind is the onm work now everyone seems to be doing their own onm work um, we are not very sure how scientifically it's done one uh, how capable are the companies to do it themselves and as lenders you um, would always want a third party to vouch for what's going on with your uh, borrowers so we would we would want to um, see this whole onm segment to become more organized uh, get serious players um, who are who are not just doing onm for the sake of it but uh, as uh, the gentleman from mitra mentioned uh, who 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 has the capability to actually contribute uh, to the sustainability of the project onm is one thing that i can think of right now there are there are many other uh, aspects um i was meeting a lot of people here in the hall and uh, a lot of them ask me can you can you fund 100% of the project no we cannot <laughs> i don't think anyone else can because um, they the well. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um i think they do 100% of the project <laughs> well yeah <laughs> so um no on paper we cannot fund 100% of the project uh, and um, it, it's not a wise thing to do <laughs> and so that equity ratios dscrs these are some things that um, we sense developers are uh, now you know uh, becoming very careful about they, they they understand that it's not only about equity irrs but also to have uh, lenders on board and uh, uh, this this whole project has to be refinanced at some point of time um the good part is the ticket size is small um so refinance is not going to be a challenge in my view there are um, institutions there are development uh, uh institutions so we had someone from erida we had abilak from erida we had uh, we have adb lines we have um, world bank lines so there's a lot of focused concerted efforts from the banking and finance fraternity also uh, to develop the sector but it has to be uh, a very very um i would say cautious uh, uh, optimism kind of an approach uh, that we uh, did with maybe toll road or uh, tra transmission sometime back but there are there are spots of um, sunshine and i think uh, smaller institutions like tata clean tech will capitalize on this because uh, like like he's talking about uh, the the poor stay, uh, health of uh, discoms there are also a lot of psu banks which are struggling with similar issues and the solution to that was uh, new nbfcs coming in uh tapping the market where you need to um getting you know getting in touch with the whole customer base that the bank is not able to lend to one because of their own internal issues and two because of the uh, caps so all banks have a power sector cap they are all struggling with their power sector books so that's an opportunity for um, nbfcs or infra finance companies like ours to uh, come and fill the gap I think one more issue that uh, we've we've seen a lot of uh, you know capital raisers face in the market is lack of a business plan. So uh, you know uh, somebody mentioned about uh, uh, you know no barriers to entry yes. in this business, and uh, invariably what we're seeing is that all the places where we are able to successfully raise capital are the are the developers who have a business plan who have something that separates them out uh, uh, you know from other market players uh, so for example i think uh, when amplis raised capital and they, they positioned themselves as an energy solution provider that was one of the first uh, you know positioning uh, uh, you know business plans that we saw in the market and it will be very important that all developers try to see as to what is it uh you know what is their overall business plan what will differentiate them in the market and why should an investor uh, you know invest in this particular business plan i think that's that's an element that is clearly missing uh, in a lot of uh, finance uh, raising activities uh, but but going to the point that you were making on banks i don't know vivek what has been your experience with the banks so 
uh, funding is, I mean, every entrepreneur around this room will tell you, I wish there was more money available. So I will say the same first. I think second is, uh, in my same view on the uh, net metering CIG play, I will say life is significantly better this year than it was 12 months back. So there's a lot more money available now uh, than there was uh, a few months back. Uh, and, and that's good, that's positive. Uh, I think in the, um, so let's start at the first end, right? So take customers first. So there are customers and if you are a good quality customer with a decent balance sheet, there are developers available who will take away the entire need for financing from you. So you can buy power. Uh, I think that's fabulous from a customer's perspective. He doesn't have to get to the banks, he doesn't have to raise his loan, he doesn't have to put his equity, he's showing his intent, his business model, his sustainability for the next 20 years and um, there are people who will come and put up solutions for you. So that's great from a customer perspective. Two, I think developers earlier were struggling from a, uh, from funding uh, and of course uh, clean tech, Tata clean tech capital has been uh, there for, for some time and, and leading a lot of effort there. But take the SBI line or the PNB line uh, and, and so on, these are compelling and the rates we're talking about with some of them are lesser than what utility scale solar gets in certain cases. So um, look, I think I again, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say the same. I think life is significantly better than it was and, and that's great. I think the, the, issue, the issue will always stand out to be what track record you are demonstrating in terms of returns. Uh, so fine, on paper this makes sense. Uh, have you shown that return over the period of three years? How much is your customer saved? How much have you uh, saved as a, as a developer? I think if you can sort of showcase this, uh, you know, money will flow if there is value. Uh, and I mean, sorry, most of us are finance guys, so we will say money will always come if there is value. I think value needs to have been demonstrated. Uh, it is getting, uh, it is, the returns were there, Earlier, the scale wasn't there. So now returns and scale have come and therefore both debt and equity will make its uh, presence and is making its presence in this market and, uh, and there will be more money available for sure. And in fact, the good thing is that there is a lot of uh, international capital which is now available to be deployed as debt. So, you know, we all read about, uh, uh, you know, some of the bonds that have been placed recently, let's say by Green Co or Azure, and basically these bonds are being used to repay, uh, uh, you know, bank loans in the individual projects. So the good thing is that even for debt, uh, until very recently, uh, projects were restricted uh, with access only to domestic uh, lending institutions. But, uh, you know, refinancing is now becoming a reality uh, in, in, in the sector. I think just uh, one more point on that. Sorry, Ritu, okay. before uh, you do that. I think the, uh, when you say international capital is available, put that in context, it is available because in India, we are proposing solar as a cost reduction tool. So we are not even, uh, you know, we are not any program built out of a feed-in tariff model uh, as most of the West has seen uh, and, and is growing because of. So uh, there is a very compelling story we are, we are having in place here and therefore finance has to and will come uh, is, the, is the play. Just exactly. a word of as, uh, sorry. As Vivek was saying, we are pitching this as a commercially viable venture. And uh, so you're right, uh, but your point, Shishti, about having a plan going ahead, and we had that plan going ahead very early on. And uh, money did come in. There's a lag between when equity came in and when debt came in. And debt was always available to us. It was just that it was not making sense because we needed debt to reduce our cost of capital. So if the debt is coming to me at the same cost as equity or even slightly higher, that was not making any sense. Obviously with the uh, World Bank line through State Bank that we've got, it has reduced the cost overall cost of capital and we see more and more debt being able to come in. Obviously, financiers will look at your record, will look at your business plan. So the, when the equity came in, there was hardly any record to go by. But today there's like a three year track record of what is happening, what efficiencies have you got, how are you doing your O&M, what is your future plan, what's your you know organizational target, etc. And our story has been very strong, which is probably why so far we've achieved whatever level of success that we've got. And it came at uh, sometimes taking very hard decisions when a, de a debt was not available. We took a call that we are not going to do AD investors, we are not going to do third party. Everything is going to be on my balance sheet because I'm building my asset books from here. I'm in here for the long term. And we lost our accounts on, on that account because 
everybody here knows that if you, you use the AD model, especially when it was 80%, you were getting a certain amount of, you know, 20%, 20 pesa difference in the tariff. And we've lost accounts on account of that. But if you're here for the long run, then you can afford to do that. Uh, Absolutely. One it's thing, in fact, yeah. in complete congruence with what I was about to say. So um, with Amplus, I remember uh, we, were, we were evaluating a lot of transactions together, and very recently we closed something together. And this, uh, uh, the, the, the fact that you have now aggregated uh, respectable capacity has really added value and was one of the deciding factors in my committee at TCCL as there, so I know. Um, a word of caution on the bonds, you should not try to mobilize, uh, or you should first try and aggregate and only then mobilize, because if you do not have a critical mass, there are a lot of unforeseen costs, um, be it hedge costs, be it uh, fees you pay to legal agencies, credit rating agencies. So there are a lot of unforeseen costs that you have to uh, keep in mind before uh, going the bond way. But uh, yes, I, I do see that happening in the next six to 12 months very clearly. Uh, one thing just I wanted to add is uh, uh, from a lending institution perspective, as in what we would like to see at least, uh, this, is, this has been my experience is that uh, non-recourse financing is not happening in the rooftop side. I understand the risks, I understand uh, uh, the viewpoint of the lenders, but there has to be some mechanism or some sort of, uh, I don't know, insurance instruments or some sort of uh, uh, a way to uh, evaluate or uh, hypothecate or whatever it is that, that can make these 100% non-recourse financing, uh, financeable projects, particularly in the rooftop segment. If that happens, then it's the best thing. Absolutely. So with uh, non-recourse, you mean no collateral, no corporate guarantee, no person. It's just against the cash flows. Against the cash flows. Yes. yes. I understand that you need the background of the company or the promoter, etc., cetera, et cetera. Right. All of that will be there, the business plan and the credentials. But beyond that, once the project you have established is a viable project right. and that it is, you see that the risks are taken care of or in some form that Absolutely. the risks are mitigated, yeah. then uh, I absolutely. think if you should, you should look at non-recourse based uh, right, right, right. project financing for rooftop project. Right, absolutely. So in fact, we are one of the few who are going in that direction. And I don't think we um, have any recourse on any of the uh, distributor generation assets that we have financed. So I think non-recourse funding has been on the wish list of infrastructure as a whole and energy in particular for a long, long time. <laughs> and, and you know, non-recourse does not exist in India. So even if they call it non-recourse, uh, yeah. invariably all international investors ask us the question, well, this is not what we call non-recourse in our country because there is a sponsor support uh, for cost overruns. There is a cash shortfall support. So, so I tend to agree with you that, uh, you know, the banking sector has really mm -hmm. matured uh, uh, in India, but unfortunately for infrastructure, uh, they have not matured enough. No, I think I should also correct myself. I did not mean no sponsor support because there have been limited or uh, um, at least till operation or till uh, stabilization. We have sponsor support in few transactions. So it's, a, it's not completely non-recourse in the purest form. But uh, yes, we are going in that direction. Uh, as the timekeeper of the conference. Thank you very much, panelists. Indeed, uh, very, very interesting uh, discussions about technology, policy, finance, the RESCO model, the way it was presented by the panelists. Thank you very much. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. I now request Shishti Ji to present uh, mementos uh, of appreciation and presence. Uh, could we take it, like, because we have a time? There's no point in having a session if we don't have right? Yeah, but we... I want to know if uh, ESCO has been actually uh, measured for maturity in the sector of finance. ESCO has been actually what? Matured for I financing. Matured for financing in the sector. I have if somebody would like to briefly touch this up. So I wouldn't want to um, paint the entire ESCO uh, fraternity with the same brush. It's wrong. Uh, there are ESCOs which are mature. There are ESCOs which aren't. Um, there are a lot of models that are evolving. Um, we are evaluating a few ESCOs which are uh, absolutely credit worthy and we will participate in ESCO financing pretty soon. We are also a partner with uh, uh, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, you're aware of. So I, I, I don't want to comment on whether all ESCOs are credit worthy or not, but uh, uh, just like every other sector, some ESCOs uh, have their own problems. You're looking for some ESCO partners. 
Okay, probably you'll need to touch base with the Bureau of Energy. Ashish. Yeah, Thank you very much.